My answer to the title's question is, stay and find out. I, I cannot describe Dark Souls 2 with one or two words like I did for Dark Souls 1 or Bloodborne. This game has done multiple good things, amazing things, yet so many awful things that got fans enraged. Even I couldn't help getting mad here and there. But partially I suppose that's why you voted Dark Souls 2 in the poll I created, right? To see me suffer. Okay, say no more, let's jump straight into this frying pan. God, Dark Souls 2 loyalists are going to kill me. Being Dark Souls 1 direct successor, it took the same formula and improved on many aspects, but not so much on others. For the people who liked quantity, this game was heaven when it came out. It added around 80 to 100 new weapons and people were like, wow, I'm going to pass out, so many options I feel like a kid in a candy store. But then, the longer you play, the more you realize many of these new weapons are just skinned with different stats, which is fine in a way, but if you are looking for moveset diversity, you won't find it here. Check this out, the Pike, the Stone Soldier Spear, Hades Spear and Pate Spear have the same R1 moveset, medium thrust, low thrust. This Dark Scythe, this Halberd and Sentier's Spear have the exact same moveset, R1s and R2s. I know these weapons all belong to the same category, the former to spears and the latter to halberds, but yeah, I've always preferred quality over quantity, that is why I'm a Bloodborne fanboy, but hey, to each their own. What I do love about this game is the invention of power stance. God bless its comeback in Elden Ring. If you wield two weapons of the same category on each hand, you can activate this by holding triangle, and what you get is a more damaging moveset that also costs more stamina, and that is original for each weapon's category. It looks so stylish to attack with two katanas at the same time. Damn, I hated Dark Souls 3 for not bringing that back, instead of opting for giving us weapons that were already two-handed, and that is it. What a downgrade. What's more, the addition of omnidirectional rolling while locked on to the enemies is nice. Some attacks are highly punishable if you roll diagonally to your opponent's left or right, so I am glad they took their time to improve this coming from Dark Souls 1, where you could only roll left, right, forward and back. By the way, this game was the first one to introduce a respec option, where you can relocate your attribute points if you find a soul vessel and bring it to the lady in things betwixt. Long gone were the Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls days of starting a new character only to try a new build. There are 6 vessels available per playthrough, so they give you a lot of room to try new things. Another thing that I'd like to highlight that they did really well in this game is how the game progression order can be real different from player to player. They did an outstanding job with enemies and boss scaling to break with any type of lineal progression. If you have ever been lost in this game, and don't lie to me, of course you have, and you looked up on the internet searching what the fuck is the next area after this one, you'll see that many Redditors have made their progression public and the results are crazy. You even have the freedom to kill the same boss many times by resetting an area with an ascetic so you can access the Shrine of Winter and go to Drang Lake without much deviation. In my case, in my third playthrough, I remember, I killed the Rotten like 7 to 8 times since the bonfire was right next to his fog. This way, I didn't have to kill a single additional boss other than him before going to Drunk Lake Castle. Let's give it a small pause to say thank you guys for improving the weapon upgrade path from Dark Souls 1. Like I said in my Dark Souls 1 in 2024 review, this was utterly disgusting and luckily, it was made simpler. Additionally, some realistic touches here and there, like liquid poison getting scattered all over your clothes as opposed to poisonous gas, can affect you in different ways. If you enter a puddle of poison, the status bar will continue to increase for a longer time, even when you're nowhere near something poisonous. But then, you can clean it off with water and you're good to go. Electricity also does more damage in wet environments. For instance, check out this zone before Drang Lake Castle. It is raining constantly, so let's compare the damage between these enemies here and these enemies there. And personally, the best addition to this game is the bonfire ascetic. 
I can't believe they haven't brought this feature back to their new games. It is such a game-changing option, like, instead of starting NG+, you can move an area of your choice into New Game Plus indefinitely, as long as you have the ascetic consumables to burn at your bonfire of choice. Did you like a boss so much you want to fight against it straight away? But you don't want to start a whole new adventure and play hours upon hours until you get back to this boss? Say no more. Reset his zone and fight against him right now. Man, the things I would do to have this in Bloodborne and fight Ludwig and Lady Maria all day long... <sighs> a man can only dream at this point. Dark Souls 2 has some really detailed and attractive environments. Yet others, well, I'll leave them to your judgement. By the way, are you tired of hearing that Dark Souls 2 did cool things and some really bad things? I hope not, because that is a recurring theme in every aspect of this game. I'll try not to make myself too repetitive. Again, this game thought. You know this old saying, sometimes less is more? Let's add a twist to it and turn it into more is more. That makes more sense, right? This game has 30 areas, as opposed to Dark Souls 24. And I am saying 30 because I am not counting the giant's memories, the dragon's memories and Throne of Want, since they are either too small or add not much more than lore effects. What's more, I am not even counting the DLC, I am saving it for another video, otherwise that would make it 12 more areas. If they capped things that ambitious, they would have run out of map ideas faster than Call of Duty for Christ's sake. So my question is, are they coherent, well designed, appealing, fun? Well, sometimes they are, <laughs> but when they aren't, they really suck. Oddly enough, Majula is my favorite hub area in Dark Souls games. Last time I played this game before replaying it for this review was halfway through 2021. And let me tell you, that Majula theme brought back some nostalgic memories of easier times. Moreover, it is a beautiful place that feels even more appealing when contrasted with places like the Gutter, Lost Bastille, No Man's Wharf, amongst others. Also, NPCs there feel like a real functioning village that does its best to help you. Then you have other areas that I really enjoy like Forest of Fallen Giants because of its interconnectivity despite its size. I mean, the area is huge but very entertaining to explore and open new paths with keys that function as shortcuts. It is like the typical From Software level design that wasn't very present in this game as a whole. Then you have Hades Tower Flame and the Cathedral of the Blue, which are also very likeable, not because of its complex layout like Forest of Fallen Giants, quite contrary, it is almost a 100% linear path, but because of how beautiful it looks, the knights pose in a challenging manner and wait for you to start a duel, next to an endless sea that has covered pretty much all of the city, this knight guards a lever that can increase the area of the Dragon Rider boss fight and consequently make it harder for your character to fall off the stage. Then you have Drunk Lake Castle, which is filled with secret, be it hidden doors, a lever to open a shortcut, sometimes you have to defy gravity to reach some hidden chests. It fits the whole castle scenery very well. These areas, I have just mentioned, are really well crafted, for one reason or another. But then we got others like Black Gulch, where you can't see a damn thing and you have to lice these statues to see where you'll go next. The whole level is pretty much Tomb of the Giants, but not as bad. Still, I always log off when I get here because I don't want to spend 20 minutes jumping from one place to another and killing enemies in the dark, especially knowing what comes next. The gutter. Despite being one long ass hallway towards the boss fight, it sucks quite a lot if you take your time to kill the enemies and explore it, because before you realize it, you have been poisoned. And you have to fight these hands, worms and invasions while losing health. Don't even tell me to break the statues before they spit on me. Imagine having to dedicate your time to do that every single time you die, it's obnoxious. At least this whole ordeal can be avoided if you have a branch, since it unlocks a bonfire that is right next to the boss fog wall. I wonder why they put that there. 
If they know that this level sucks so much, people wouldn't want to repeat it after dying each time. What could be worse than that? Shrine of fucking Amana. This place is just terrible if you want to explore everything. Cliffs underwater, this Dragon Rider's positioning in the bridge, and the Magic Snipers. The latter is by far the most annoying thing since their projectiles even track you, and the cooldown between one and the next isn't very long. Every time you get to fight an enemy, be careful not to trigger one of the sorceresses, or you will be in a world of pain. Screw this! By the way, did you know that this game was going to be an open world like Elden Ring? Yeah, if you investigate enough, you'll find out locations were supposed to be better connected, but all of a sudden, they had a deadline shoved down their throats, with many constraints, so they just had to slap obviously impossible connections between areas such as tunnels and elevators that are there mainly to load the next area. One being the tunnel to Drying Lake Castle, where you can see from one side it's all a mix of sunny and cloudy, and seven seconds later it's dark and rainy on the other side. And the most mythical one that everybody complains about is the poison tower on the peak of a mountain that allows you to ascend through a lift to thousands of kilometers of grounded lava, supposedly in the sky. You can't really blame them for that laziness, at least they tried to come up with an excuse where your character's Halloween distorts his sense of reality. They did not have time for much more. Remember to subscribe if you are enjoying the content and would like to watch more Souls reviews in the future. It helps me out a ton. One more time, let's say it all together, boys and girls. More is more. More is more. 10 more than Dark Souls 1 and 11 more than the original Demon Souls. 32 bosses in total. Is that huge number justified? No! As in my other revisited series, I'll leave a green thumbs up for the bosses I liked, or at least that I did not dislike, and a red thumbs down for the ones that, in my opinion, have negative fun factor. The Last Giant, the intended tutorial boss fight, Although, it doesn't help you much with your boss training, because the next three supposed bosses you'll get are dudes in armor, not giants, not monsters, just dudes fighting with weapons. But well, it is fine, I guess. You cross between its legs every time it attacks, and you're basically invincible. The Pursuer is fine. This boss, as many others in this game, contains a shenanigan in the arena, to make it easier, which is shooting it with the Ballista to deal a ton of damage. If you don't do that, it is quite an engaging fight. Don't be greedy, manage your stamina, and you'll be fine. For Christ's sake, run as fast as you can when you see his blade go blue, because the hitbox on that crap is unbelievably broken. The Dragon Rider is pretty easy. The gimmick here is that if you don't kill this armored dude and pull the lever, the arena space will be vastly reduced, which will make it easier for you to fall. And the same goes for him, actually. Bye-bye. <laughs> the timing of his attacks are easy. No delayed attacks, nothing too fancy. Perhaps he can also be considered a tutorial boss if you went to his area before Forest of Fallen Giants. Old Dragon Slayer. Wait. Scratch the Dragon Slayer part. Let's just call him Old. Because this man has a literal dragon chilling right in front of his cathedral and he is doing no slaying at all. I am disappointed. Imagine seeing this dragon there and thinking, hmm, what will I do about it? Just to get closer and see him make a huge leap and slay the dragon with one blow to its head. That would be really intimidating and a nice introduction. But well, not much else to say here, he's just Ornstein 2.0 really. That doesn't make it unfun, just unoriginal. This boss fight is okay. I think From Software has never put a time limit on a boss fight, like the longer you take, the more difficult it will be. In this case, with the water rising and making you slower. But aside from that, I am out of words. There's nothing special about this one. It becomes a normal enemy later in Sinner's Rise, which makes him minus two in the special boss scale. The Sentinels are your average gang fight in Dark Souls 2, but this time turned into a boss. It is really boring and uninspiring, especially since it also turns into a normal enemy later. Generally, I don't have much patience for 1v2s and 1v3s, but I still try to finish them alone. But yeah, 
This was my fourth playthrough of this game, so screw patience. Get me those summons so we can make this a 3v3. Another game. My god, how could you take the gargoyles from Dark Souls 1 and turn them into this messed up damage per second test? You even copied the same soundtrack, I mean... God, how lazy can you get? The Lost Sinner is a solid fight, really. I like how you can light the torches in the arena to make it brighter, and thus have a longer lock-on range to see where the boss is at all times. Fighting him while dark is not only hard because it is hard to see, but because your character will lose lock all the time. Really well thought, plus the fight is engaging and quite frenetic. He doesn't give up easily to let you heal. The Chariot is an annoying puzzle fight that has you moving forwards to pull down a lever to make the horse stop running. Additionally, there are immortal skeletons running around, so you have to kill the necromancers that won't stop reviving them. And guess what? The horse becomes a normal enemy later. Oh, brother. Skeleton Lords. Another gank, but this time even more pathetic than the gargoyles. Have you realized that 4 out of the 10 fights I have mentioned until now are groups instead of legit 1v1? Well, this is not even a group fight done right. Covetous Demon is utterly trash. His only redeemable quality is he is easier than Rick Soldier of God. He is just a man who was rejected by Mitha, the zone's final boss. His way of showing his love was basically eating and he did it so much he turned into this. Come on guys, not even his lore is great, talk about a waste of time. Mitha is an okay boss fight. That is if you find out about burning the windmill. This game has got some cryptic shit going around here and there and that is one of them. Can you tell me how burning a windmill drains all the liquid poison out of this boss's arena? You have literally no hint whatsoever that this is even a thing and if you don't do it, the fight is basically impossible because firstly, you lose health due to that toxicity and secondly, she heals anytime she is on poison. In other words, she would spend the whole fight healing if you don't drain it. Amazing. Smelter Demon is fun. He is your standard boss fight where there aren't any shenanigans until halfway through his health bar. Be mindful of his constant fire AoE damage if you get close to him. Solution, equip a ring that increases fire resistance. Nice. Old Iron King is just baffling. The actual difficulty of this fight is not him and his attacks, but to avoid falling down to the lava. The arena is smaller than that 5'8 friend who says he is actually 6 feet. And it has holes in it, so I'm not exaggerating when I say you'll die more to falls than his actual hits. And there is a slight chance that at the beginning of the fight, he will just stay there, far away, shooting crap at you, while you can only evade and expect him to come closer soon. This sucks a lot. Nashka, or Quilag 2.0, just joking, they don't have much in common besides being half chest, half insect. I like her fight. No gimmicks, just a cool 1v1. Sometimes she will burrow to come out of the floor with an attack, but it's nothing too fancy to evade. Royal Rat Vanguard reminds me of that Celestial Emissary's fight in Bloodborne. You get a ton of NPCs that respawn indefinitely and you have to guess who is the boss. At least in Bloodborne, the Celestial boss turns into a giant halfway through. In this one, the Chosen Rat is just a normal enemy with a bigger health pool. Duke's Dear Freya is nice. It is a good balance between difficulty and fun since you can only hit a head to deal damage, but be careful, its main attacks also come from the head, so you have to be careful not to overextend. From time to time, she will switch the location of her head to another part of her body, which makes it spicier. And there's a gimmick where if you bring a torch, you won't have to worry about the other spiders. Royal Red Authority sucks ass, simply because the X factor that decides if you will beat the fight or not is if you get poisoned by the small rats at the beginning. If you get poisoned, you'll most probably die. If you don't, this is a cakewalk. Plus, the big boss is just a bigger version of the dog slash rat hybrid. Unoriginal as fuck. The Rotten is not a bad fight. Another straightforward 1v1. 
The fire in the arena deals damage, but there is plenty of space to maneuver around it. Watch out for the f you get off me explosion and you're good to go. If you don't have a branch to unlock the second fog fire, this can be quite annoying. Like the walk back through all the poison statues, the hand enemies, the invaders and the worms, but... Well, you can blame the boss because of his run back, right? A repeated boss fight that turns into a 2v1 that also appears later in Shrine of Amana and Undead Crypt as a normal NPC? Get the... Looking Glass Knight is an awesome 1v1 duel, except for the fact that it is not 100% a 1v1 duel. Halfway through, he'll let out an NPC invader from his shield's mirror. Have fun redirecting your attention to the damage sponge that he just summoned. Or you can ignore him and wreck the knight. Either way, not something enjoyable. Oh yeah, and the cherry on top of the cake is not always that invader would be an NPC. If you're unlucky enough to be fighting this boss and someone in another world next to your soul memory left a red sign in Drang Lake Castle, they will most likely be summoned to fight you alongside the knight. I think I don't have to explain how utterly unfair that is, right? Demon of Song is pretty forgettable in terms of gameplay. Please, pay close attention to the footage while I'm talking and you'll see what I'm talking about. Don't get me wrong, I don't dislike it, but man, the design of this repulsive thing is such a waste when you take into consideration his moveset and his health. What a waste. Velstad might be one of the best fights in the base game, honestly. In a game where more than half of the fights have dumbass gimmicks or are ganks, I appreciate the simplicity of fighting a dude in an honorable 1v1, where you have to time your roles correctly, not get greedy, pay extra attention to his attacks when he buffs himself and do all that to die when he has 1 HP left. It's truly the essence of soul gaming. Guardian Dragon. Nothing special really, stay in between his legs, cut his tail to avoid the tail whip attack and voila, you'll be done with him before you even notice. Next. I think Ancient Dragon was Midir's predecessor and in influence in terms of health pool, but entertainment wise, he did not rub off on Midir. Look, the stage is nice and the idea of fighting this humongous dragon is challenging, thus it can make you think it will be fun, but then you get completely taken off guard by its dullness. According to the wiki, it has six attacks, but when I fought against it, it was a festival of coming closer to him, having to run away because of his rain fire attack, rinse and repeat three to four times, and when he's not doing that, he just stands idle, tanking hits. Jesus, like how they mess this up is beyond me. It's a dragon. How can you ruin a dragon fight? Giant Lord might look cool, but he acts mostly like the last giant. Stay between his legs and job's done. He even helps you by screaming when he is going to attack to compensate for how you can't see his torso when near him because of how tall he is. He's such a nice guy, actually. Throne Watcher and Defender brings nothing new to the table, just your usual 2v1. and They buff their weapons halfway through that health bars. Wow, guys, you are so cool. Congratulations. Yeah, of course I summoned. Lucky for Nashandra, the curse status does not insta-kill as in Dark Souls 1, otherwise this would be a contender for worst boss fight ever together with Bed of Chaos. She is not difficult, keep close and avoid the curse sources that she summons, if you move away from her she will shoot a beam which inflicts quite a bit of damage. If you go away to heal, wait for her to shoot at first and add human effigies to the shortcut just in case she manages to reduce your health by a lot. Vendrick has seen better days. I totally respect that he is not an interesting boss fight gameplay-wise since he is completely hollow. Make sure to visit all giant memories and keeping them in your inventory, otherwise you'll deal miserable damage to him. After that, it is a breeze since his attacks are pretty slow and he is not oppressive either. Aldia will only spawn if you kill Vendrick before Nashandra. Truthfully, Dark Souls 2 kept its theme of half-assed boss fights by adding an abhorrent boss for the endgame. This thing just teleports somewhere in the arena, shoots a few projectiles or tentacles, allow you to hit a few times and do the same thing over and over until it dies. At this point, I think they just ran out of ideas because holy hell this is bad. Dark Lurker is a good fight by itself. 
While editing the footage, I will resist the urge of giving it a thumbs down because of how utterly fu the walk back to it feels. It is quite a difficult fight, but yeah, from software people thought it was a good idea to only be able to access it if you give a human effigy in exchange. A finite consumable at that. Bravo. And you have to kill all of the tanky NPC invaders so you dispel the fog to access it. Every. Single. Time. From software developers are a bunch of idiots sometimes, I swear to god. Am I forgetting something? I swear this game had 32 bosses, but I have only listed 31. Ah, yes, yes. This game's been well. They even share the same strategy. You press R1 and everything dies. You can even try to be so bold as to press R2 to deal extra damage, but be careful. This is a high-risk, high-reward situation, ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> what a complete joke, honestly. <laughs> As usual, when I revisit these games, I try to show the good and the bad. And as always, I remind you that the title is House Dark Souls 2 in 2024, which means I am trying to give my opinion based on how the game's holding up after 10 years, and that includes common complaints that still affects the game to this day, and also some personal ones. Let's start with New Game Plus. I get that Dark Souls is the only from software game where they've tried to spice things up by adding new enemies and some twists, like being able to fight the Duke's Diophragia in this location, some items in chests are changed, you get new rings, Hades White Knights starts to appear in Forest of Fallen Giants and at the Bastille. These changes are okay, but they are a minority because most of the time, the only change you'll be really noticing is that they add red phantoms to areas that are already bloated with enemies. In retrospective, when this game came out, it felt pretty easy, and that was something inconceivable because of the huge marketing campaign behind it, stating that you will die a lot, the ladies in things betwixt mocked you due to how many times you would be killed, and in Majula, there's a huge monument bragging about how many players the game has killed. In other words, they fully embraced the you will die a lot advertising. So, with Scholar of the First Sin, they added many more enemy NPCs to make it harder, and you already know what I think about quantity instead of quality. So yeah, adding more new enemies, but now with a red invader skin, does not strike me as a cool change. And for the love of god, what were they thinking adding two enemies to the Flexile Sentry and two red phantoms and at the Lost Sinner boss fights, it doesn't make any sense to slap new enemies at a boss fight that is not designed to be a 3v1. Look, I appreciate the effort with the mobs and red phantoms, but don't ever try to do that again. You can spray perfume and scrape gold on a pile of shit as much as you want, but it will still be a pile of shit. Continuing with the enemy's rant, if you aggro an NPC, have you noticed that they will follow you until the end of the world like a homeless dog that you just gave food to? And how curious is that? This is the only game where enemies can interrupt you from crossing a boss fog wall. I am positive that this feature has been created to pad the playing time and make it longer than usual. Just imagine, Smelter Demon is not an easy fight, so you will probably die a few times. Imagine that every single run back to his fight you have to kill every alone knight so they don't follow you to the mist. That is disgraceful honestly, I will 100% clean a level once, even again and again in subsequent playthroughs, but doing it for each boss fight try in some situations? The same goes for the Dark Lurker boss fight for obvious reasons and maybe for the Chariot since the Executioner guys will follow you to hell and back and killing them every time is a tedious task. Yeah, you can laugh, I died like five times to the chariot while recording. Now, I will proceed to beat a dead horse, and that horse is called adaptability. In case you don't know, rolling in this game is pretty unsafe, so the player has to increase this stat to have more invincible frames while rolling and not get hit by dumb shit. Differently from some people, I will say adaptability is fine, because leveling up in Dark Souls 2 is really cheap. 
I ended up this playthrough sitting at like level 150, 160, and I haven't even touched the DLCs, so sparing a few coins to increase it is no big deal. The thing is, how are you supposed to find out that this new stat will give you back the iframes from your role that were removed from the first game? Dark Souls 2 crypticism is beyond necessary as a whole, but ruining a base game function because you don't want to imply what adaptability does is dumb. The menu says adaptability helps your character survive by increasing a bit of each stat, but there's not a stat for rolling, so it is not something you can visually see. And here we go, for the fifth time in this playthrough, back to Saint Google not to ask where the fuck to go next, but to find out why my rolling sucks. This issue is a big part of why hitboxes suck in this game, and you can see in the clips being shown now, especially grabs, which have a tendency to catch even when you roll out of its reach, it's amazing. Following this, soul memory might be one of the stupidest things to ever happen to online soul gaming. I'll keep this short because my rents are lasting way longer and I don't want to seem like a hater, because I'm not. So basically, soul memory was created to avoid veteran players with level 10 gear preying on actual new level 1 players. Soul Memory is a system that, instead of pairing you with other people by level, it pairs players by the total amount of souls their character has absorbed. Online co-oping has always been a difficult thing until Bloodborne, where you could create a personal password that you'd share with your mates and make it easier for players to match. Yet, Soul Memory made it even more difficult because, have a look at how utterly complicated they made it for people to co-op. Pay close attention to what I am about to say because it, it's easy to get lost. There are two objects to be summoned and co-op, the small white soapstone and the normal white soapstone. The small one lets you be summoned as a shade, which means you can be summoned even if the boss has been killed, but you have limited duration, like when you are the giant's memories. The other allows you to be summoned as a normal phantom, but only if the area's boss is alive. Good thing is you don't have a time limit. Then, to increase the odds of joining someone, put on an engraved ring that allows you to choose one of 10 gods and simply, if two players share the same god, it's easier to match. But the odds of joining someone fall into brackets, like I am showing here. If you have obtained, let's say, 400k less souls than your friend, it will be hard to match you guys together because you'll be in different brackets far from each other depending on the game's progress. They screwed up and they know it because in Scholar's version they added the agape ring that absorbs all souls you obtain, and thus they don't count to your character's soul memory. A possible scenario where this would work is if you have 200k soul memory and you want to stop increasing it because you want to play co-op with a friend who has 80k soul memory, equip the ring, stop earning souls while your friend plays normally and earns souls until you are both 200k. Best part is, this ring nullifies the whole soul memory stuff, and it can be obtained pretty early on, you just have to kill the Dragon Rider, the Flexile Sentry, and nullify straight petrification and bias from him. It is completely stupid and beyond cryptic. Why can't we just play together without having to worry about so much random shit? Fuck! By the way, if you did a soundtrack recognition test based on Dark Souls 2, would you guess at least a third of them? I don't know if it's just me, but the tracks from Dark Souls 1 and 3 are easily recognizable for me. And if I don't, chances are I still like them, but for some reason I can't associate them to their respective bosses. I didn't want to include DLC talking here, but I think it is unfair to talk about themes without including Seer Alone, Sin, the Dragon, and Ivory King's tracks. What I was talking about is in the base game, besides Majula, Nashandra's, and maybe Velstad's, what other memorable tracks do we have? For a game with 32 bosses in the base game alone, it surely is lacking in the OST department. I have a few minor complaints that are more personal and other players might not mind. Firstly, this game takes a more strategic approach to the Souls formula. Spamming roll consumes more stamina, your health bar reduces with each death, amongst other features that exist to make the players be more mindful instead of just in bashing their heads mindlessly at each challenge. This is fine, but healing on the other hand… Look, 
if I manage to get away from an enemy, go through the longest Estes drinking in the series and finish chugging before a boss hits me, why should I still be in danger of death just because the healing isn't instant but progressive? Secondly, I preferred the leveling up at bonfires from Dark Souls 1. I tend to level up before boss fights with the souls I have accumulated from going through the levels to have more chances of winning. And this means when I fight against the bosses who guard primal bonfires, I have to make two trips to Majula, one to level up and another one that is compulsory after activating these bonfires. Like I said before, it is not a big issue since it only happens like at least four times per playthrough, but going back and then going back again and then back to Majula again, it can be annoying to have to eat three loading screens just because I don't want to possibly waste all my souls by dying at the boss. And lastly, I hate being invaded by NPCs and even freaking online players while I'm hollow. The way I use online features in this game is pretty much finish my first ever playthrough alone and in the second journey I summon and help other players. I don't like PvP in Souls games, so I'm glad with the formula they are currently using in Elden Ring. If you're playing solo, you remain solo, unless you ask to be invaded. If you summon an ally, you are open to invasions, simple and effective. To sum up, if you haven't played any From Software games, you would do yourself a favor by playing this one first. It suffers the DMC Devil May Cry and Resident Evil 6 syndromes, where it is an actual good individual game, but not a good continuation to its previous installments. The game was being developed with goodwill. It was an ambitious project that had to be cut to meet deadlines, so we don't have a typical Ubisoft or Electronic Arts situation here, where games sometimes are shipped in a bad condition because the developers just don't care. Despite the times I got mad while playing through it and how I wished to be playing Bloodborne or Sekiro instead, I still have a place in my heart for this game because it still carried out that unforgettable Dark Souls melancholy and nostalgia that can't be found in any other games. Briefly, my verdict is that the game is fine. In spite of all the negative things I mentioned and the 10 heavy years that it carries on its back, I still think you could pick it up and have fun. Just don't compare it too much with the others because they are on a league of their own. Thank you comrades for spending your time here and see you in the next one. Peace.